from Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Thank you for joining the McLaughlin Group, a show where friends disagree agreeably. I'm your host, Tom Rogan. This week's panelists are author and columnist Pat Buchanan, columnist Eleanor Clift of The Daily Beast, columnist Clarence Page of The Chicago Tribune, and my colleague at The Washington Examiner, Tiana Lowe. Okay, let's get to issue one. 232 to 196. In a 232 to 196 vote on Thursday, the House of Representatives formalized a process for the ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Two Democrats joined every voting Republican in opposing the motion. The, the vote means that themselves. Democrats will be able to proceed this, towards more public really hearings. Like In other impeachment-related news, President Trump this week criticized Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, a U.S. Army officer assigned to the National Security Council. Colonel Vindman testified in relation to his concerns over President Trump's summer phone call with President Zelensky of Ukraine. Pat, should Democrats, even though they've got this pretty overwhelming majority, be concerned with the two defections? No, I don't think so. They give these two guys a pass because they've got a rough district or something like that. But look, this whole thing, it shows how political and partisan it's become. All the Democrats basically on one side for impeachment, all the Republicans on the other side against the hearings. Pelosi appoints that very Solomonic judge and jurist <laughs> Schiff, Schiff, to, run Schiff, yeah. the, to run the show. And look, let's take a look at the high crime and misdemeanor. What have we talked about? It now comes down to the fact that Trump may have suspended for two months the delivery of lethal aid and javelin missiles to Ukraine, which Barack Obama denied to Ukraine for five years. So my view is this is what this is becoming is Schiff's operation is really the opposition research arm of the Democratic Party trying to smear and stink up Trump before the election of 2020. And I think that's all it amounts to. And I think the American people more and more are seeing this as an utter partisan battle. Uh, well, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Alexander Zindman gave compelling testimony. And I hope we will see him testify in public uh, later this month when the public hearings uh, begin. And he basically talked about uh, being on the phone call, listening to the phone call with the president and the pre president of uh, Ukraine. And he documented everything that the whistleblower has been telling us, that the president basically uh, held U.S. military aid as leverage over an ally that was in a hot war with uh, Russia in exchange for finding dirt on his uh, political appointments and the um, political opponent. And the fact that Zinman uh, said that the transcript was altered that the ellipses that were in the transcript that was released to the public mm. actually were areas where, yes, mm -hmm. where Burisna, the, the company came up that, uh, where Hunter Biden was on the board, and Joe Biden's name uh, came up. And uh, there was enough consciousness of guilt in the West Wing that they uh, doctored the transcript and that they put the original document in this so-called secret server. So you have the elements here of abuse of power and you have cover up. And I must say the vote where not a single Republican joined it is a problem. I'm not going to say that's not a, not a problem. And it's the, a lot hangs now on the public hearings because the, the public gets a vote here. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in the six swing states that are going to decide the election, a uh, majority of people are opposed to impeachment. So this now is a battle for the hearts and mind of the American public. And if the Democrats can get John Bolton right. to testify, and he appears open to responding to a subpoena, that could be a defining moment. Tiana. Yeah, I think the bigger issue here is that there were no Republican defections from the party line rather than the two Democrats. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at those districts, those are R plus 10 districts that they managed to sweep up because 2018 was obviously an uncharacteristically good year for the Democrats. But the issue here isn't, it, it's not about five years versus two months. It's about American interests versus Trump's personal interests. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the powers of the presidency were used to advance his own personal goals should matter a lot and more. And you than believe that's been shown now? I, but absent any new evidence that comes up, we have the Bill Taylor testimony. We have Vindman corroborating it. We have Tim Morrison corroborating it. The only person who looks like they intentionally lied is Gordon Sunland. 
Mm-hmm. So if if this information continues to be corroborated, and that's why it's important mm-hmm. that we innocence until proven guilty. But if it does show that Trump is guilty of a political crime, the abuse of power, then that should matter in the minds of voters. But it won't necessarily because Democrats undermine themselves so much with Mueller mania. They ran with there wasn't smoke, let alone a gun. And they ran a two year investigation where they swore they would prove that Trump was personally colluding. But you're saying there is a there is smoke. Here, here I think there's smoke. So you say be patient, Democrats. Yes, yes. Clarence. Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, you, you raise very good points there. Uh, and, uh, and I always ask myself two questions every day. One, how would Republicans respond if Barack Obama had been accused <laughs> of this array of charges here? I don't think I need to go into what we all right. know. Number two, how would, uh, how would uh, uh, we uh, or, or history have been changed if Richard Nixon had responded the way Donald Trump has? Uh, Pat, you're more, you, you have more firsthand experience, but the rest mm-hmm. of us all watch it every day. Right. R- Richard Nixon... It looks very admirable nowadays because you see he had, he he had enough civic then. duty. He looked yeah. admirable that well, 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 you know, he had enough sense of civic duty to know when to step aside. Donald Trump is gonna fight till the end. That's why and, and, and he's the only horse Republicans have to ride right now, so, so they're sticking together. I, and that's why what's making this such a, a clash at this point. But there's still uh, a lot of evidence to come out. Uh, it's uh, disturbing that people, uh, uh, so, so many people uh, are, are opposed to okay. impeachment at this point, but a lot of them simply because we're so close to an election right. uh, yeah. day well, that they don't to, want to Let's go to the substance of the charge. It's alleged that uh, Trump said in a quid pro quo, look, you'll get your meeting at the White House, you'll get your weapons, et cetera, as long as we get an investigation of Biden. When you get down to the bottom line, they got the weapons, Ukraine got the weapons, they got the meeting in the White House. There was no investigation carried out of Biden. There was nothing done. When it gets to the Senate, it's obviously going to be impeached. It's baked in the cake, as I said last week. But when it gets to the U.S. Senate, the question is not going to be, you know, did Trump consider, you know, quid pro quo? So you're applying the kind of judicial approach of cause of action. There's no action. No, my belief is this. When it gets to the Senate, they're going to say, look, this was an unwise thing to do, but nothing was consummated. Secondly, it doesn't rise to the level of impeachment offense. Well, Goodbye and good luck. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's the new defense now. That, that, <laughs> that, is, that is the new defense. He did it. That's what it doesn't I gave matter. You. Right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, Democrats are going to say we have a president who's willing to uh, put uh, your national security at risk to advance his personal Who's interests, as, as you pointed out. And I want to say have... ab- about Richard Nixon, your old boss, uh, he, he stepped aside in a dignified way after he knew he was going to be <laughs> right. forced out of office. Right. So he had no other choice. And 50 years this weekend is the anniversary of the phrase that the President Nixon used about the silent majority that Pat Buchanan had a hand in thrusting into the public domain. And that is a phrase that pits, it's us versus them, and it's the same road that President Trump is going down. Yes, sir. That's true. November 3rd, 1969, (laughs) the silent majority. Nixon did that after he tried to get along with the Democrats in his whole first six months. 250,000 people demonstrated in October. Another 250,000 were coming in November. Time Magazine and Newsweek said, Get ready, Nixon, prepare us for a defeat. And he said, no, I don't think so. All right, but Pat, let's bring it back to 2019. I mean, I I appreciate the horror of historical context, but do you think then, your implication seems to be ultimately the electorate will decide this next November? This is exactly right. We got an election coming up in a year. Tell them what Trump did, what he didn't do, what Sunland said, what so-and-so said. Let the American people decide an election. That's what we hold them for. Well, let, let me ask Tiana, and then I'll come back. What should Democrats then be doing different, do you think? Because you seem to be sympathetic to the investigation. What should they be doing different specifically? Get Adam Schiff out of there. He is politically toxic. I don't think that anyone on two millimeters to the right of Joe Biden trusts Adam Schiff. Jerry Nadler, maybe people trust him more. However, there will be a sizzle reel of everything Nadler said back during the Clinton impeachment. Do you think people trust Speaker Pelosi more? I think objectively they should yeah. i don't know if they do okay i don't <laughs> think this is about adam schiff yeah, i no, mean yeah. basically um nancy pelosi held off on impeachment as long as she could but the president kept defying the norms and when the whistleblower came forward uh with what he with with what he or she revealed what was going on in the white house and then you had democratic women who were just elected in 2018 with intelligence and CIA backgrounds, military backgrounds, who 
stepped forward and said, this is about national security. I think the Congress had to act. Otherwise, it would set an incredible precedent for future presidents is what you can get away with. He's probably not going to be removed from office, yeah, but, but the voters in 2020 deserve to know what went yeah. on. But it, the thing is, you, it is going to set a precedent. I'll tell you, the next time, let's suppose the Democrats win, the day after the inauguration, they'll start picking up string for, to impeach the Democratic candidate. Secondly, this is astonishing. I mean, I've worked in the White House to see these 25 people sitting there on a telephone conversation of the president talking to a foreign leader, and then some of them saying, I don't like what he's doing. I think it's wrong running to counselors and stuff. What are, what are we doing to the office of president of the United Let States? Me ask well, some, well yes. change the whistleblower law if you don't like it, but most people like the idea of, of there right. being a watchdog, whether it's a Democratic president or a Republican. Right. Isn't there right. a point, though, you know, President Trump's base mm -hmm. voted for him, at least a significant part, because they had lost trust in the political system. Right. They were furious with the political elites as they saw it. To Pat's point, though, isn't that kind of what we're seeing here, that, that the political well, elites do not like the president, said they don't like the call, and that actually, this might help President Trump because he says, look what I told you in 16, it's happened now. Well, let the public decide. I love the way elites are thrown around this day. My, my, my mother would be proud that, hey, hey, my, yeah. my son's part of the... Well, East you're a Pulitzer Prize, you're definitely elite. an elite. Right. 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 Well, thank, thank you for that. But a good elite. quite seriously, though, uh, I think it's always helpful to have as much public disclosure as possible. I think that this is not making President Trump look good, maybe among his base, but they don't change. You right. know, it just doesn't matter. I think Democrats worry, my, my view is that Democrats worry too much about the Trump base. They ought to talk about those middle Americans out there, sensible Americans who do listen to evidence and who do see, uh, by the way, the, the uh, Mueller report is not a dud among uh, most voters I've talked to, it seems like, you know, especially, especially in the upper Midwest. You're talking Midwest. to the wrong voters, yeah. Clarence. Well, especially in the upper Midwest, Pat. Yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, most of them are, are, are Democrats, <laughs> but there is a lot of uh, those important look, swing states know, out there. there. There's a lot of political peril here, mm -hmm. again, in the six states that are going to side this, this election, the three that gave uh, the, pres the presidency to Trump in the Electoral College, plus Arizona, North Carolina, mm -hmm. Florida. Uh, impeachment is not polling well. But John Bolton is not a faceless bureaucrat. And uh, you're no, demeaning no. people who worked no, in that I, White I, House. Lord, National that, Security finish, Advisor uh, okay. Alexander Vinden no, no. Has, has credentials look, that Vindman, should shame any Republican right, who tries to undermine let's say him. He's, look, maybe he got the Congressional Medal of Honor and he's a decent, honorable person. The thing is, we have the transcript of the phone well, we conversation. Might, no, we perhaps, don't. Perhaps we okay, don't. perhaps we, <laughs> we don't. don't. If the, that is a real problem. We don't. But we don't need everybody's commentary on what but do, it Okay, says. let me push you on that, though. You do, think, do you think it is a real problem if that transcript turns out I think to... There, I, I think there probably is in the transcript more than, than was, excuse me, less right. than as obviously on the tape. Right. But I don't think there's anything on the tape that is explosive. Okay. 25 yeah. guys No, missed. but they were aware enough that they took it out and that they stored it in a secret well, place. Well, I'm sure that's an issue Again, for let, let, consciousness of guilt. All right, right let's bring Tiana in for so a final comment. We have a transcript, but it was unclear whether or not Trump was simply making a request without hinging aid on it or if it, in fact, was a quid pro quo. Where, these, where, these, meet, where these meetings <laughs> matter is we need to know if Sondland was telling Yermak you get nothing unless if you announce and commit to the Burisma investigation. And that's what it looks like but now. clearly he was bluffing All because right. he got everything All right. he wanted. <laughs> okay, concluding comment. One interesting thing here is the Russians love to spy on Americans in Ukraine. So maybe this is another Russia thing we can look into in the future issue. But I do think it is positive <laughs> that we are, do it. <laughs> we are moving into a more public forum now to right. uh, examine these issues. Um, as Eleanor suggested, I think Democrats need to expedite the process uh, because mm -hmm. in those swing states, there is concern that independent okay. voters might not like this. Anyway, issue two, Dorsey versus Zuckerberg. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey this week announced the suspension of all political advertising on his social media platform. The news was welcomed by those who fear political advertising is being used for the purposes of manipulation by hostile actors. But Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says his platform will continue to allow political advertising. It's an issue of free speech, Zuckerberg says. Eleanor, where should the line be drawn here between free speech and half-truths or untruths? It's complicated. Uh, as a journalist, I tend to be an absolutist about free speech, but I think we are in a different world now. And uh, Twitter has thrown down the gauntlet to these other companies that don't really want to call themselves media companies, but they are. 
And I think Twitter is doing the right thing. And I think uh, Zuckerberg is under a lot of pressure from the left and the right. Uh, what he's doing is not working. And now uh, it, you've had, since World War II, you've had a number of uh, hate speech laws, particularly in Germany, uh, to av avoid a Holocaust. And so um, this is not clamped down on free speech in these countries. So I think there needs to be some lines uh, that are drawn particularly around political speech. Pat, mm -hmm. but do you think then, you know, it seems to suggest, Eleanor, there may be, and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but, but moving towards a sort of caveat to the First Amendment, which probably the Supreme Court would say requires a constitutional amendment. Would, I suppose you probably no, wouldn't. No, there's, I'm, I'm not an absolutist on the First Amendment at all. I mean, there's a lot of things, fighting words, I mean, there's libel, there's slander, there's defamation, there's mm -hmm. things like all kinds of things that are limitations, at least after you've done the speech. But going back to Facebook versus Twitter, it looks to me like both of them are saying, look, I don't want this problem. We're going to take everything, and we're not going to judge it, or we're going to take nothing. Right. But if they don't want that problem of sitting there themselves and deciding, mainly it's conservatives, frankly, who want to be able to get onto this, these various sites because, I mean, they feel that when you get the major yeah. media, it tends not well, to be supportive of the Well, that's Section 230 and Josh Hawley. Yeah, what do you think also. about that, Josh, yeah. Josh Hawley's effort? to reform Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. To, that would allow, that, that Facebook, he says, does it prejudices against conservative speech. You know, I think you can take a look at it, but the thing's going to wind up before the Supreme Court in any event. Exactly. All right. Yeah, well, while you're conservatives complaining about not be, being able to get their message out, I'm reminded of Stephen Colbert referring to President Trump as, as the world's most powerful victim, because <laughs> that's the line uh, that, that, that everything is against us, but we're managing to fight on and blah, blah, blah. Great. The fact is that uh, I'm the First Amendment absolutist, and that includes... Uh, recognizing all Supreme Court decisions right. and fighting words and, uh, and various obscenity cases and all. These get, get hashed out. That's how our system works. But no, number one, uh, these are not public utilities. They, uh, Facebook and Twitter, they're private companies. They have, uh, but the First Amendment uh, applies in a different kind, kind of way to them. Uh, but we all agree that for the good of, of the media, press should be as free as possible. Voices from both sides uh, should be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, uh, they uh, uh, what really disturbs me is Zuckerberg trying to ignore what he knows are untruths going out. Uh, that's something that we in so-called mainstream media try certainly try to avoid, but Zuckerberg is being very casual about that, and that's where they're going to run into trouble. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, and Jack Dorsey is allowed to do whatever he wants, but clearly this, I mean, he's just misdiagnosed what the problem on Twitter is. I, there are actual death threats on Twitter. There are, will wind up being actual deep fakes on Twitter that could constitute like a violation that would wind up having mm -hmm. Twitter be forced to litigate in tort law. The idea that, that Twitter's misinformation problem is because Cory Booker can buy a presidential campaign ad just shows how out of touch Dorsey is. What about is. Vladimir Putin doing some of his stuff? Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? You think? So, but that's not necessarily covered by this because you know a, a Russian troll army probably isn't paying right. for ads so much as they're aggregating right. fake accounts. And that's a completely different issue, one that right. can be dealt with on a one-by-one one system or one that can be dealt Good with point. by a these, these blanket bans make no sense. Jack Dorsey eats five meals, a, five meals a week and it shows. This is clearly just a decision that, I mean, I know he thinks he can own Mark Zuckerberg, but ultimately, who is the person who's created this more successful platform? And Mark well, Zuckerberg, <laughs> Eleanor, you suggested, you know, Mark, that he's going to have to change. And yet, this week, he, Facebook posted some pretty amazing <laughs> profits. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, a future Congress is going to put some regulation in here. Elizabeth Warren has been talking about breaking up Facebook. She makes a very compelling uh, case, and I think she's got some friends on the right as well. And, uh, you know, if death threats are made on Twitter, that's kind of a separate conversation from political ads. Well, uh, this is not. To be focused um, on. So, anyway, I, th I think Dorsey has raised an important but, issue know. here, and uh, he's, 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 he's moved this into this, this center of congressional activity for the future because regulation has to come from somewhere. You know, death threats are, are criminal. You do something right. like that, I don't care where you do it. You might yell at somebody and threaten them or something like that. But you mentioned truth, you know. But there's, a, you know, it's fairly old. What is truth? You go back to, uh, Go back to the, you know, the New Testament. I prefer the word facts. <laughs> yeah, okay. no, truth I mean, is kind of, kind of a ethereal. When, when you're just asking these folks to decide that, they bring to that their own biases right. and prejudices and mm -hmm. beliefs and experiences. What was wrong? You mentioned the World War II and the Germans, et cetera. You know, in, uh, in Turkey, 
if you deny the Armenian yep. slaughter, which they called a genocide in Congress this week, that's criminal. And if you if you if you if you if you deny it, excuse me, if you deny it in Paris, it's a crime. Right. Well, let's mm -hmm. argue about the gray areas, but let's put some some firm lines in in place that you can't cross. I think they're 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 in place for the networks, the cable networks. Uh, print media has to obey certain things. Why should these media companies, which are bigger than any other, well, uh, they say because they're a or, provider, a yeah, facilitator. They are, they are well, the, well, they're, 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 they're not. Them. They're not. They're not a utility, as, as, as Larry said. Yeah. said. You, like, <laughs> Facebook is a platform that connects half the planet. Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. created it in his college dorm room using twenty thousand dollars of seed funding from his best friend. If you want to regulate Facebook, go make your own. I don't really like Facebook. I only keep it as a digital Rolodex for people that I've met throughout my life. <laughs> I don't like Facebook, so I don't use it. I don't give them clicks. I don't use it for my logins. You don't like Facebook, don't use it. I don't you, you have do, anything you, you personal. Ways, I don't, like have, I don't have anything personal against Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not trying to undermine okay. his fortune. I'm just recognizing the power that he has, and I don't think one platform should have all that power. Well, you, you just raised another <laughs> issue, though. Uh, young folks don't like Facebook like old folks do now. No, <laughs> and no. It started out just, just the reverse. And then, just as my son tells me how to work Facebook, suddenly he says, well, nobody uses that anymore. Everybody uses Twitter, right? And, and now it's Snapchat or something. I, I, but the fact is that, yeah, there are different audiences. And I will concede, Pat, that, that conservatives, from what I can tell, have made, made much better use of Twitter and Facebook early mm -hmm. on in forming networks online, getting mm -hmm. their, their, their message out. But certainly liberals have the same right and the same ability uh, the, you know, the reason, you get, I think, the the reason you get some liberal resistance is just what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Conservatives are saying, you know, we want the ads on both of these platforms, you know, and we want to keep that there, and they're trying to discriminate against us. You know, everybody's battling for his own interests. Oh, yeah. And I tend to agree, you know, these things, what are, we got back to an earlier argument, mm -hmm. what are they, publications or are they platforms? Yeah, and, and here's a little pop like quiz question. Telephone. I think they're media companies. Okay, what's, here's, here's a pop, pop quiz question for unlawful, imminent violence, okay? The uh, mm -hmm. unlawful speech, fighting words. Do you know what the three prongs are? Imminence, mm -hmm. likelihood, and intent. So mm -hmm. it's a far higher standard than Europe. But I have to say, personally, I think I've grown up in Europe. I, I mean, I really am a free speech absolutist. So I disagree with Warren on this, disagree with Hawley. I, I kind of think as a country, we should hold ourselves as individuals to a higher account in terms of scrutinizing what we read rather than saying government protect us from our own you, stupidity. Let me ask you a question. How does the political discourse be improved and advanced by including and not discriminating against flat out lies? Because as a country, we've built on a tradition that the ultimate best ideas You're telling me we're built on a tradition. Yeah. Okay, I'll go along with that. So, but how is the dialogue improved if we allow deliberate falsehoods, they, lies, defamation, slander. We have laws because, against that. <laughs> yeah, because we're watching it in real time, how uh, lies and slander and all of that can be disseminated via Facebook and these other companies in, in seconds. Uh, there's right. a disgust yeah. and a re revulsion in, a, in the broad populace I think that something a, has gone with awry think, with these companies. I think, and it's, I think it, there's, you're exactly right, and I think it's moving right. against the whole idea of absolute freedom of speech or freedom of Exit press. question, very quickly. <clears throat> so you'll want two, two answers to this, yes and no, or no and no. Do you think Congress will pass legislation to restrict this sort of online space? And do you think the Supreme Court will uphold that legislation? Yes and no. Great. Depends on what the Congress uh, passes, whether the Supreme Court will throw it out. He can't do it, yes or no. <laughs> right, I would say y yes and yes, but not the current Congress. It's coming eventually. I hate to be a funny duddy, but I want to see the wording of this regulation. Well, look at <laughs> this. Really well, thank matter. you to, to Eleanor and Tiana for giving okay. me my yeses and yeses and Clarence and Pat instructing <laughs> me. All right, predictions, <laughs> Pat. Uh, there's a Virginia election coming up Tuesday, and it's going to have some pretty dramatic results. My guess is uh, for, for both Republicans and Democrats, depending on where it goes, and I'm not I'm a little bit apprehensive. Okay, all right, <laughs> Eleanor. Okay, with <coughs> another, another election coming up in Kentucky mm -hmm. uh, where you have a very unpopular governor, Matt Bevins, uh, seeking re-election. You have the president going in there on Monday night to try to rev up his base. It's a state he won by 30 or 34 uh, points. Uh, Mitch McConnell is really nervous if the attorney general of the state, uh, who is now even in the polls, 
if he should pull off an upset, that would be a real signal that McConnell himself might even be in trouble. Interesting. So fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tiana. Katie Hill is absolutely getting a cable news contract. There's no way that she doesn't, because there is no issue in the media that I've seen in the past year where the media is so divorced from what the average liberal in the country believes. I'm not even saying just centrist Democrat. Liberal American, they do not see a case of a victim. They see a case of a serial abuser who entered illicit relationships with two of her subordinates more than a decade her junior, and the media will reward her for it. I Who's the victim, her or her husband? Which uh, network <laughs> will this uh, be giving her? Be I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. All right. <laughs> you actually beat me to the Katie Hill story. Uh, let, me, let me say, I think Paul Manafort's going to be pardoned. Okay. I predict that Boris Johnson's re-election or effort to, to win a new majority in Parliament will be harder than he thinks. I think the polls are slightly inflated. Nigel Farage is going to cause problems for him there. But before we go, let me share a quick thought on Charlie Ingracia. Charlie, the son of acclaimed journalist Paul Ingracia, was a dedicated Chicago attorney and a great fan of our show. Tragically, however, after a final struggle with cancer, Charlie passed away earlier this year at the age of 39. I had the fortune of meeting Charlie's mother, Susan, earlier this week. But I would encourage you to Google Charlie and Gracia. You will find many wonderful tributes to a man who never gave in. Although Charlie suffered various forms of cancer from childhood, he lived a life of strength, success, and humor. He even helped a free a wrongly convicted man who was serving a life sentence. We hope you're enjoying the show from heaven, Charlie. Thank you for all of you for watching. See you next time.